Atlantis ISS, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Yes. We're ready for the event. JSC PAO, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Atlantis ISS for a voice check. Atlantis ISS, this is Johnson Space Center PAO. How do you hear me? Hello, Johnson Space Center. Uh, we have you loud and clear on the International Space Station. Good morning. This is Eric Berger with uh, Houston Chronicle. Congratulations on such a great mission so far. Um, there's been a lot of talk uh, about first, or excuse me, last during this flight, and I want to ask about a first. Uh, specifically, uh, do any of the crew members of Atlantis plan to stick around with NASA to fly on the MPCV, or is that something that is a bit too far in the future? Thank you. Well, I think if you asked any one of us, we would uh, love a shot at flying another vehicle. So uh, definitely, um, you know, and we've got opportunities prior to that. You know, we've got uh, multiple flights to the International Space Station. Uh, you know, we, we're going to crew this beautiful complex for the next uh, 10 years plus. So uh, there's plenty of opportunities to fly, and uh, I don't see any reason why not stay and uh, see what happens. It's a real bright future. Good morning, Ted Oberg from Channel 13 here in Houston. Uh, great to talk with you guys. I, I'm, I'm curious, um, what have you done in your downtime on this mission uh, to make sure that you capture some of these last moments? Uh, what, what things have you made sure you saw out the windows or done with the shuttle? Uh, t tell us a little bit about how you've spent your downtime. Uh, well, well, for me, uh, I, I had a chance to look out the uh, look out the cupola, which is a great window, and we can see the aurora australis, the southern lights. We all kind of crowded around and got to see that, and, and just savoring every minute of uh, of floating in space. And then once in a while, when you're on Atlantis. Uh, when you, at the end of the day, you kind of look around the mid-deck and think of all the guys and women who were there before you and who had a, uh, had a part in the space program, and you think, wow, this is, the, this is the last flight. So it does cross your mind once in a while. Good morning. This is John Donlin with Fox 26 here in Houston also, and uh, I'm passing along a question from one of our viewers. Uh, she wants to know, what will the astronauts be able to take from the last trip, and will you have a job when you get back on Earth? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, Johnson Space Center, although uh, we're reaching the end of the space shuttle program, is still a vibrant place to work. Uh, there'll be a transitional period here as we hand over a lot of the responsibilities for going to low Earth orbit to our commercial providers. But uh, this is an opportunity for us to look beyond low Earth orbit and uh, b perhaps back to the moon or to an asteroid where we'd like to travel too soon. So there'll be plenty of work in the Houston area. Uh, good morning, uh, Mark Caro from uh, Aviation Week, and my questions for uh, Sandy. Could could you describe for us the the pace of the activities uh, the past week, and just what it will take to wrap up the restub before you undock? Thanks. Well, Mark, the pace has been very, very. Uh, busy, busy, busy. Uh, just right when we hit orbit, doing post insertion with four people was really challenging. We were working really hard right up to bedtime. We got had a little bit on flight day two, but since we docked a station, we've been working uh, quite a bit. I think we're getting ahead now, so hopefully the rest of the pace of the mission will slow down a bit and we can actually savor the moment a little bit more than we've been able to until now. Hi, morning. This is Denise Chow at space.com. My question's for uh, Commander Chris Ferguson. Um, having the opportunity to fly in space and spend time on the ISS, uh, you and your crewmates have a unique perspective of our planet. And uh, for those of us on, on Earth, I was wondering uh, what message you would have for why it's important to continue exploration, particularly manned exploration beyond low Earth orbit. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, first of all, uh, you, you really don't get a firm appreciation for just what a fantastic place it is until you've had an opportunity to look out of the cupola. Uh, just over the last couple nights, uh, we've had some incredibly dramatic passes that, have, uh, that showed the, uh, the southern lights, uh, just a, a vibrant green color. Um, and uh, there was a, a tremendous picture taken last night with a silhouette of the International Space Station and uh, the space shuttle in the background. 
And there is, uh, I'll tell you, there's a little part of uh, everybody who looks at something like that and says, I cannot believe we're here. This is absolutely fantastic. We absolutely must continue this. And we must go beyond, and we must go uh, back to lunar orbit and perhaps to an asteroid. Uh, we need to continue pushing on. We need to press technology. And, uh, you know, humans are destined to explore, and this is what we do, and we need to continue. Gina Sinceri, ABC News for Mike Fossum. Mike, we thought we heard you trying to whistle before your spacewalk on Tuesday. Tell me a little bit about that and why you couldn't whistle. And then when you're done, I'd like you to whistle a tune for me. I'll pass the second half of your question to my uh, spacewalk buddy, uh, Ron Guerin. <laughs> uh, we, uh, Ron and I were both doing a little whistling in the airlock. It's just one of the strange phenomena where as the pressure is dropping in the airlock, our suit is just, uh, you know, a little over four pounds of pressure. And once this air pressure inside the airlock goes down close or goes down to zero, then your overall pressure is down low. And I think it has to do with the air, the density of the air, but I really can't explain uh, a, a lot about the, uh, probably a, the, uh, the resonant frequency of the, um, of the cavity of your mouth as you are blowing the air through it like that. And uh, so it's kind of interesting. Nobody, I mean, we can all whistle, uh, you know, a normal, and Ron will do the tune. Uh, but <laughs> as it's one of the things that you can physically use to just take a look and appreciate the fact that, uh, that things are changing. You can feel the air that you're breathing in is different. It's a lower density, and you can tell that. We have a card, kind of a procedure card in the airlock, and you can wave that back and forth. And as you do, you can feel less resistance on it uh, as the air pressure is dropping. The whistling is just something else to have a little fun with while you try not to think about uh, what's going on. Now Ron's got a whistle. <laughs> this is Jill Tolk representing Bay Area Houston Magazine. A two-part question for Fergie and Ron. Since each of you has connections to Pennsylvania, what personal earth obs of that state have each of you made during your respective flights? And Fergie, have you seen the east coast of Australia through the cupola yet? Oh, gosh, Jill. Uh, first of all, how are you doing? Um, you know, I wish we had enough time to look out the window. We did catch a little look at uh, Philadelphia, the Philadelphia, New York, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the Philadelphia, New York area. We passed uh, over there, I think it was the evening of flight day two, and we had a chance to look out. Um, and have we passed off the east coast of Australia? Yes, absolutely we have, and I think that's one of the opportunities we have to take a look at the southern lights, but I really didn't have an opportunity to do a whole lot of uh, coastal searching, if you will, to find out exactly where we were. And I'll turn it over to Ron. Well, um, Sasha and Andre and I have been here 101 days today, but who's counting? And so we've, uh, we've had a lot of opportunities to look out the window, a lot of opportunities to see our unbelievably beautiful Earth. And uh, yes, I've uh, uh, had the opportunity to see Pennsylvania. I've taken some pictures of uh, one of my favorite places in the world where I spent the happiest day of my life uh, over 20 years ago, getting married in uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania. So uh, I've definitely uh, has, have some great uh, pictures of, of that area of Pennsylvania, that really beautiful area of uh, Pennsylvania. Hi, this is Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com with a question for Rex. Uh, there's a tradition among shuttle crews to leave their mark, their mission patch, on various walls of the space station. Can you share where you and your crewmates plan to leave your emblem, and will you be adding any other commemorative uh, mementos or emblems to signify this is the last space shuttle to visit the ISS? Uh, yes, they, we, uh, they do have a place where we leave uh, the uh, patches and our stickers, and uh, we're going to leave our patch probably in node one, and we should leave a sticker in the airlock because uh, we consider ourselves one big team here uh, with the shuttle and the station, and we all executed the, the spacewalk. It was Mike and Ron, the great guys who went outside and did that spacewalk, but uh, we all helped them, and so we're, we'd like to put one of our, uh, our mission uh, stickers in, uh, in, the, uh, in the airlock. In regards to uh, other things that we're leaving up here, um, uh, I'll let uh, Fergie, if you have any uh, other, other additions? Sure, we can talk about it. Yeah. Uh, yes, we do have a... Uh we have a special uh, item we're going to leave behind uh, in, in what hopefully is a, is a very oh, thought-provoking and, and emotional uh, farewell ceremony that we have as the space shuttle prepares to leave the International Space Station for the final time. And I would just ask you to perhaps uh, hold on until that moment and you'll get, a, you'll get a look at what we have in store.
Atlantis ISS, this is Houston ACR. That concludes questions from the Johnson Space Center. Please stand by for a voice check from Kennedy Space Center, PAO. Atlantis ISS, this is Kennedy Space Center, PAO. How do you hear me? Hello, Kennedy Space Center. We have you loud and clear. Hello, Kennedy Space Center. We have you loud and clear. Hello, Kennedy Space Center. We have you loud and clear. Magazine. I was wondering if you could highlight some of the scientific experiments that you're working on uh, on the International Space Station that you think will particularly inspire the public back here on Earth. Well, that, that's an excellent question. You know, we've had uh, a permanent human presence on the International Space Station for over a decade now. And over that time, we've conducted over 600 uh, scientific experiments. And, you know, one of, the, one of the things that we're trying to do is to see how humans can go further in exploration, go beyond Earth orbit, explore our solar system. But nearly all of the experiments that we conduct have a direct application on Earth, uh, from growing crops better to making new materials, new medicines, uh, we were, uh, had some very significant research uh, in the development of a vaccine for salmonella, uh, studying our Earth, learning how uh, uh, the uh, learning about the human impact uh, on the environment, uh, how the inner core of the Earth uh, works, and possibly lead to uh, better ways to predict earthquakes, uh, better safe automobile safety, better uh, uh, energy efficiency, fuel efficiency. So the list goes on and on and on. It's just amazing the research that's being conducted up here. And that's because this is a very, very unique environment. The research that's being conduct up, conducted up here simply cannot be done anywhere else in the world. And so that's why this is such a, an, an important research facility, and this is really a global asset, the International Space Station. Hi, Ken Kramer from uh, Space Flight Magazine and Rittenhouse Astronomical Society. My question is for uh, Chris and, and your crew. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the science that you've personally seen uh, going on at the space station. Uh, anything about the AMS? Can you see the AMS from the cupola at all? And any interaction with the Robonaut? Thank you. Uh, absolutely. We had a, a great opportunity, Ken, to see it uh, out the window. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, on the first EVA, the only EVA, Ron and, and uh, went out there to uh, to put another payload and had an opportunity to take a, a loop around it, and we had a chance to watch them out the window. So it's out there, and we understand it's just doing fantastic science. Stephen Young with SpaceFlightNow.com for Commander Ferguson. There's a public perception that your flight not only represents the end of the shuttle program, but the end of the U.S. manned space program. Do you have any fears at all that your crew might be the last uh, astronauts to blast off from American soil? Well, Stephen, I'll tell you, no doubt that this is a, it's, it's a very dynamic time in human spaceflight as the, uh, the space shuttle draws to a, a, a close uh, without a real uh, clear picture of how the next U.S. astronauts will get there. But rest assured that there are plans underway. Uh, we'll be slowly uh, transitioning uh, to commercial companies. And I, while it's a, it's a little you know, personally disheartening to see the shuttle come, we understand that you know, sometimes you need to stop working on what you're working on so you can afford to pay for the next generation of whatever it is. And in this case, it's the next generation of aircraft. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, I think it's a unique opportunity. Um, you know, just like the airlines uh, did several years ago, it was largely government-funded research that, that uh, made tremendous breakthroughs in aerospace. Uh, only to hand it over to commercial companies in the form of airlines. Uh, you know, the, the government has made tremendous strides in getting to low Earth orbit, and, and we're going to hand that technology over to uh, commercial providers, and, and perhaps one day we'll have uh, space line companies. This is Leo Enright for Irish Radio's Today with Pat Kenny program. A lot of Europeans have flown on the space shuttle, but uh, sadly, no Irish. Um, so a lot of our um, younger listeners will be worried now. Uh, will they ever now have an opportunity to fly in space? Do you have any reassurance for them? Well, actually, uh, I'm, I'm a fair amount Irish, and uh, I'm up here today. So, you know, we'll call that good enough for now, and I guarantee you there'll be a, an Irishman on board a spacecraft in the not-too-distant future. So I don't think they have anything to worry about, and I think they should, if they're interested in spaceflight, to just continue to study hard and uh, 
you never know what what would come next. Uh, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press, with another question for Commander Ferguson. Back in Houston, you described for me the overwhelming sensation that shuttle crews get when they pause at the base of the pad on launch day and look up at the ship. I'm wondering, can you tell me what that moment was like for you last Friday when you looked up at Atlantis, knowing that's the last shuttle launch? Well, I'll tell you, uh, Marcia, it is... Uh, that is one trip that every shuttle crew has to make, um, and uh, I think I speak for everyone who has ever flown on a space shuttle to stand there uh, poised at the bottom of a living, breathing vehicle, and, and it's literally raining off the side of the external tank because of the condensation that forms from the extremely cold cryogenic fuels. It's, uh, it's wheezing, it's hissing, it's moaning. You look up at it, and I remember my first commander looked at me and he said, do you believe they're going to let us take this thing into space? And uh, with every uh, subsequent crew I've been on, I've, I've, uh, I've tried to share that same, uh, that same reflection with, uh, with my crew. It's, it's incredibly awe-inspiring. And just like the pictures that you see the next day in the, in the photograph, it's just incredibly surreal to stand there and look up at it and know that in a matter of hours it's going to be orbiting the Earth. Good morning, Peter King with uh, CBS News Radio. This is for Ron Garen. I've enjoyed uh, following your tweets. I'm wondering, since you're staying behind, what's the best place on station to watch the undocking and fly around? And do you expect a food fight for the best view? Well, um, we're going to do a, something a little different this time. Our fly around is going to be a little different. So um, I think we're going to have some, uh, some, probably some good views in uh, some of the, mo the modules in the Russian segment that have uh, horizon facing windows. So I think uh, that'll be the best bet. And there's a, there's a few of those, so we'll, we'll take turns if, if there's a, a conflict. Hi, it's James Dean from Florida today. Another question for Ron. Uh, this is the last time, I guess, we'll in, in a very long time, we'll see a crowd this big on the station. Uh, although you'll continue to, to fly there for many years to come, will it seem a little bit smaller, a little less uh, fun, perhaps, when uh, you don't get these occasional visitors? Well, I, I think it will seem uh, a little bit smaller, actually, because um, we, you know all the all the uh, tons of cargo that have arrived uh, from Atlantis have filled this place up. So there's a there's a lot less uh, room for us humans. So, um, but th that, that is really, really important because, you know, we are outfitting this station to, to function for the rest of the decade. And uh, Atlantis has, has really set us on the pace for doing that. So, uh, and we are, we're going to miss these guys a lot. It's, uh, it's been really wonderful having them up here. Uh, it, is, it is nice to have visitors and especially great visitors like these guys are. And, uh, you know, it'll be sad when, uh, when that uh, stops. But, um, you know, we, we're going to continue on. This, this place is amazing, and uh, uh, it's going to continue to function, continue to be utilized in, in great part because of the great uh, mission so far that these guys have uh, conducted. Hi, it's Bill Harwood, CBS News, with a question for, I think, Sergey Volkov, if I could. Um, Sergey, you, you've heard the... the U.S. reporters ask U.S. astronauts about the end of the shuttle and what might come next. What do you, what do the Russians think about that when you guys talk about it, the end of the shuttle and this gap that's coming up and NASA's reliance on Russia for transportation? What do you guys think about that? Thanks. Um, for us, it's also very sad that no more shuttles will appear on board the station because thanks to this uh, brilliant machine, we were able to build this station so big and uh, ready to have six-person crew. Uh, of course, we, uh, we would like to continue to fly with our friends and uh, Soyuz are ready to continue this exploration of space uh, and low orbits. David Waters from SpaceFlightNow.com. At the beginning of the shuttle program, it was John Young and Bob Crippen. That was one end of the bookend. You're the last shuttle crew to go up. Kind of bookend this for us and tell us, for people listening to this, how you want people to look back at the shuttle program. That one for Chris Ferguson, please. Well, uh, you know, the shuttle is uh, several milestones over the course of its, uh, of its 30 
they have to um, they have to live it through the pictures and the images and the stories that the astronauts bring home. They don't get to see it and touch it and feel it like we do vehicles that go uh, up and down uh, like the space shuttle. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sobering moment. It's, um, uh, but at the same time, we're incredibly overjoyed to just have had the space shuttle for 30 years and uh, uh, to know that, uh, you know, we had this ability to go to low Earth orbit and uh, we're so much more comfortable here than we were uh, just a short time ago. And we hope that that continues on to our, our commercial uh, spaceflight partners. And Chris, I'm so sorry to do this to you, but we lost your video downlink for the first uh, 30 seconds of that answer. So if you could just start that part again and just tell us when we look back at the 30 years of these. I thought it was you didn't like my question. But anyway, when we look back, when we look back at the 30 years of the space shuttle program, what do you want people to remember about the program? Well, yeah, we don't have the uh, fade to black switch up here. I wish we did sometimes. <laughs> But, uh, you know, of course, we have the International Space Station to, uh, uh, to look back upon. If it, weren't for the, uh, if it weren't for the space shuttle, the station wouldn't be here, and it certainly wouldn't be as large as it is. It's the, that large payload bay that's in the space shuttle that allows uh, the, the, the large diameter that you see around us. It allows us to sit five across in here. If it wasn't for the uh, space shuttle, we wouldn't be doing anything like that. Um, of course, there's also the tremendous observatories that the shuttle has launched throughout its years. Hubble Space Telescope, Compton Gamma Ray, the Chandra X-ray uh, Space Telescope. Uh, plus, uh, the space shuttle has really, uh, it's, it's, I don't want to say we have command of low Earth orbit, but we're so much more comfortable here, um, you know, living and working day in and day out. And we'll look back at uh, the space shuttle as a, a vehicle that just gave us regular access and, and it, it opened up low Earth orbit so that we can go beyond and we can learn how to live uh, in areas perhaps in lunar orbit or lunar surface or on an asteroid. Atlantis ISS, this is Houston ACR. That concludes questions from the Kennedy Space Center. Please stand by for a voice check from NASA Headquarters PAO. Atlantis ISS, this is NASA Headquarters PAO. How do you read me? We have you loud and clear on the International Space Station. Hi, Suzanne Presto from VOA. Ron, can you tell us a bit more about your science activities on station, particularly any experiments you've been working on that will be coming back down on shuttle? Thank you. Well, um, that, 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 that would take a long time to answer. We've been, we have been doing a lot of science on board. And uh, as far as I know, I think the only, well, I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, human research where we're, the, we're kind of the, uh, the uh, subjects and uh, there's a lot of that science that's going to go down on the shuttle. We also have some spiders on board right now that uh, are being studied and, and they're, they are going down on the shuttle as well. Uh, but we've been conducting experiments, uh, fluid experiments, cr protein crystal growth experiments, uh, plant growth experiments, uh, uh, experiments with the human body and, and the function of the human body, looking at things like you know how to con co combat uh, osteoporosis. So there's uh, quite a bit of science going on board. Um, combustion uh, science we've been doing as well. So we are we are at at the at the beginning of full utilization of this amazing research facility. Amazing research facility. Uh, Keith Cowling, NASAWatch.com for. Uh Chris Ferguson, this is the last shuttle mission, so most of you are probably not going to get to fly again, or at least not for a few years. And that said, I have to say, it must be a little tiring for you as you try and plan a career and stay motivated. You must be like a tennis ball at times, especially when the White House proposes a policy, Congress cuts it, and so forth, and it goes in a circle, and we pretty much don't go much of anywhere. As we speak, you're floating off planet on the edge of tomorrow, literally. That certainly offers you a unique perspective and the ability to be heard. What is it that we should be doing, really should be doing, to explore space? What should our policymakers in Washington be doing? What should they stop doing? And I guess should we be boldly going somewhere or just continue to waste time uh, doing this in PowerPoint? What, what would you say, you're going to talk to the president in like an hour and a half or so, if you really wanted to say one thing to him, what is it that you would say to move forward the whole notion of exploring space for real? Hey, uh, well, hello, Keith, first of all, and uh, thanks for the question. Um, boy, I'll tell you, I, I do share a little bit of your frustration. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of major programs, uh, vibrant and very interesting programs, uh, come and go at, at NASA without 
uh, coming to uh, you know fruition. And uh, a lot of that is it's politics driven. A lot of it is funding driven. A lot of it is due to dynamic events like, for example, the loss of Columbia. These are certainly things. Um, you know, some of them are are clearly out of our control. And to answer your question, if there's one thing that we could do um, uh, to focus, if you will, uh, efforts, it's to just appeal to Congress to focus uh, on the long term. Uh, you know, look at the horizon. Don't look one or two years in the future, uh, but look at 10 years and see where you want this nation to be. And uh, I understand that the president has a space policy, and I think that that's fantastic, but we need to retain a coherent, meaningful space policy that will take us more than just one or two years in the future, that will take us out to 10 and 15 years. Um, you know, a, a decadal plan, if you will, of where we want this nation to go in space and make it a law to follow it so that, uh, you know, perhaps um, congressional representatives, senators, uh, presidential administrations are obliged to follow the policy that this nation set forth so we can chart out something that's 10 or 15 years in a destination and not just one or two. Atlantis ISS, this is Houston ACR. That concludes questions from NASA headquarters. Please stand by for a voice check from Marshall Space Flight Center, PAO. Atlantis ISS, this is Marshall Space Flight Center, PAO. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear. Hi, my name is Ricky Klaus uh, from WHNT News 19, and I wanted to ask, much of the world was watching as you guys skyrocketed into space, excited, you know, loving to see you. What, what was going through your heads when, when that was happening? Well, there's a lot of emotions going through your mind. It's it, the uh, a space shuttle launch is a very interesting experience. It's it's kind of like uh, the the year in the year prior to the launch, you're preparing for the Super Bowl, but you don't know exactly what day the Super Bowl is. So you get all prepared, and uh, even on the day of the rescheduled launch, you're looking at the weather, thinking, is, "Are we going to go? Aren't we going to go?" And on this launch, it was no different. We had a 70% uh, chance of not going, but we got to prepare as if we're going. And you, you walk out there and you look at this amazing vehicle on the launch pad and you, and you just, I, nothing comes to your mind but wow. And you get up there and strap in and you're still waiting. And uh, you never know for sure whether you're going until at the last second. Because we had a hold at 31 seconds and we are going, oh no, now what? And uh, the funny thing about that is they picked up the count and all of a sudden was like, ready, set, go. And bam, we were off to the races. And uh, we were getting shot off the planet and it was just absolutely amazing. So... The whole ride up, you, you get your big wide-eyed and just experiencing all the uh, all the, the the thrill of the G's and also the uh, incredible sights and sounds you hear. With Wave 31 in Huntsville, you guys are part of a very exclusive club on the last shuttle mission. What are some of the moments that you're relishing the most right now? Well, I think we're all relishing just the, the fact that we're in space again. We're able to float around. We're here on the space station, working with the space station crew, uh, just living in this environment and, and working hard to make this a, a better place to live and to sustain it for the next year. It really is special being up here, and, and whenever we're up here, we just try and savor that as much as we can, um, whether you're on your first shuttle mission, your second shuttle mission, or this, the last shuttle mission. My name is Monica Ricks. I'm with WAFF out of the Rocket City. And Sandy, I've been admiring your hair all morning. And this question is for you, too. You've been, this is your second time up at the ISS. <laughs> um, tell me the changes that have gone through the space station and, and how it looks now. And also, you've got six days left before, uh, you know, some crew members leave. Is there anything you want to do before you fly back? Well, certainly the space station feels a lot like home. The minute we opened the hatch, I, I felt like I'd never left. But in the, in the meantime, that since I'd been here two years ago, several new modules have arrived, uh, the most enjoyable one of which is the cupola, which is this very nice windowed uh, module that we can see these spectacular views of the Earth. So almost after, uh, a couple hours after we docked and we had a break, we all ran up to the cupola to see the view from there. So the station, you know, it's the same, but yet it's different in some ways. A lot of the operations are still the same. These guys are taking great care of it. As far as the remaining time of the mission, we're going to finish out our transfer, and hopefully we'll get that done a little bit early, 
and we'll have some time to spend in the cupola and at some of the other windows and just with our station colleagues and, uh, and share some memories before we have to leave. Atlantis ISS, this is Houston ACR. That concludes questions from the Marshall Space Flight Center. We will rejoin you after a brief comm dropout. Atlantis ISS, this is Houston ACR. Back with you. Please stand by for a voice check from the Ames Research Center. Atlantis ISS, this is Ames Research Center PAO. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear at Ames. It's going to take us about another 30 seconds or so to get all set in the camera view for you. That was probably the most entertaining thing you'll see all day. So, uh... Can I go? Uh, good morning. Uh, this is Bob Rebell. I'm with NBC Bay Area, the home market of Rex Walheim. So my question is for you, uh, Rex. What are your thoughts on the shuttle program coming to an end? Uh, what do you think its legacy is going to be? And most importantly, were you able to spot San Carlos, your hometown, from outer space? Well, to answer the, uh, the, the first one, I, I, we did have a, a pass over uh, California just in time, actually, as I was having a, a family conference, a uh, private family conference, the only one we have during the mission, uh, with my wife and two boys. And so I had a chance to, to see us coming over California. The Bay Area was a little bit foggy, so I couldn't quite see San Francisco, but it was spectacular to see the, uh, the Central Valley and uh, some of Southern California, a little bit of Northern California. The shuttle's legacy, as far as that goes, uh, number one, it, uh, it sent probes to different planets. It, it launched probes. It launched great observatories like the Hubble Space Telescope. And then the crown jewel of the space shuttle program is it uh, helped to build this magnificent International Space Station that we're on right now. It wouldn't be the size of the magnitude without the space shuttle. And the space shuttle's had a storied 30-year career, but what I like to think is the space shuttle's legacy lives on. Hubble will still be taking picture. Our crewmates here will still be doing research on the International Space Station. And the, the, that's all a legacy of the shuttle, which will continue to live on. And for the future, I'm hoping that as the, sh the shuttle's retired, that money that we would be spending on the shuttle is available to not only continue the uh, International Space Station research, but to go beyond, we need to get back in the exploration business where we're going to an asteroid or the moon or to Mars. Good morning. This is Matt Bigler, KCBS Radio, and this is a question for X or whoever would like to field it. And uh, we're speaking to you from Silicon Valley, the home of Google and Facebook and things like social media and the iPhone. And my question is, what effect do you think that some of these high-tech innovations have had on America's interest in space travel and our ability to explore the final frontier? Well, I think uh, that technology is, it, it has an inherent interest, and people just take an inherent interest in it. And I think uh, Silicon Valley is the genesis of a lot of the technology we use here on the space station. So uh, I really do think it, it plays a very important role from, uh, from, uh, from inspiring grade school kids to actually providing the science that we need to do our, do our research here. And I think that's going to always keep people curious. And curiosity is a very important thing that you need to, uh, to be able to develop a space program and then develop a good research program that uh, can really pay incredible dividends here in space. Hi, this is Jane Lee with the San Jose Mercury News, and this question is for Rex Walheim. Um, I was wondering what you felt when you found out that you were going to be on the last shuttle mission. Well, I think like most of us, I was very honored. It, it was so great to get a chance to, to fly in space again. I wasn't sure, none of us were really sure we were ever going to get a chance because they had assigned the last mission. And so we thought, well, our chance had, uh, had, gone, uh, had gone by. It's kind of like being at, uh, at Disneyland and uh, the ride closing just before you get to the front of the line. Uh, but then they added a new flight, and we were kind of getting close to the, uh, to, the, to the front, and we were, we were very, very fortunate enough to be entrusted to fly on this mission. And uh, I was extremely overjoyed to get a chance to, to, chance to come here again. It's an amazing place up here in the space station. Good morning. Alan Thayer with KFTL TV 28, and this also is for Rex, our hometown representative. Rex, I'd like to know how your many contributions to the shuttle and the ISS programs, as well as the magnificent views of Earth and the stars from your vantage point, how have all these helped shape you as a person and have led you to ponder humankind's place in the cosmos? 
Well, it is an absolutely amazing creation looking on the earth, and there's just, it, you can't describe it. And we are, uh, we're all trying to continue to this, this exploration of space, and one of the things we want to do is make it more accessible to everyday people, to get everybody a chance to come in space one day, because it, it changes your perspective. Look at us here, we have 10 people from three different countries. We have Americans, Russians, and a Japanese astronaut, and we're all working together. We live together, work together, solve problems together, laugh together, and it's just an amazing camaraderie, and we're one big team and we execute the plan as one big team. And you look down at the Earth, that's just one big planet. We're all in it together. And I think the more people we get up here uh, to see that perspective, the better off we'll be. Hi, my name is Jade Hernandez. I'm with KTVU Channel 2 News. It's the Fox affiliate. My question is for Mission Specialist Rex Walheim. Rex, tell me, students from all over will get a chance to see you in space. What do you have to tell them? How do you inspire them to look to the future. How did they get in space? Well, for me, what I tell them is, is, number one, work hard, especially in math and science. And number two, have persistence, because uh, as hard as you work, it's going to take some persistence. Because I can remember as a kid sitting in my backyard in San Carlos, looking up at the airplanes that were circling around to go land in, in San Francisco and thinking, wow, I hope I get a chance to, to fly someday. And to be right here with my crewmates, and we're flying over, uh, over the Earth at 200 miles up at 17,500 miles an hour, it's, it's really a dream come true. And it's another, I mean, just this, the, the simple things like floating and, and flying in, uh, in, in zero gravity is just absolutely amazing. Everybody dreams about, uh, about the dreams where you can fly, and here you can actually do it. So it's, uh, it's absolutely amazing, and your dreams really can come true. Atlantis ISS, this is Houston ACR. That concludes questions from Ames Research Center. Please stand by for a voice check from JAXA PAO. Uh, Atlantis ISS, uh, this is JAXA TAO. How do you hear me? We read you loud and clear. How me? Kobayashi from NTV. I have a question to uh, Mr. Furukawa, Dr. Furukawa. Well, the ISS, which everyone is on board, um, I believe um, that um, the space shuttle has made major contribution to building the ISS. And also, um, the shuttle has continued to carry the Japanese astronauts, and uh, the space shuttle will be um, ending and retiring this time. What is your feeling about the retirement of the space shuttle? Hi. Space Shuttle is a Nihon, so she, Wabare Nihon Jinni, the Space Shuttle um, is, um, has brought about hopes, uh, dreams, and also a challenging spirit to Japan as well as the Japanese people. And, um, the, um, for the Japanese astronauts who were on board the ISS, um, I believe um, that the fact that I personally was able to welcome the crew on board the last space shuttle was something of a great honor for me. It is regretful that um, the space shuttle will be retiring, but I believe that, that this is a step towards the future programs. It will be a st new starting point for future programs. I uh, think um, that the U.S. Um, and uh, American colleagues are ch have a challenging spirit, and I respect them very much for that challenging spirit. My name is Saito from NBS. I have a question to astronaut Furukawa. Well, I'm reading your Twitter messages all the time. Well, you've said that you've grown accustomed to zero gravity. And have you experienced any changes in your physical condition or your mental condition, something interesting? And um, also, um, could you talk about it from a doctor's perspective as well as an um, individual's perspective? It's very difficult to make a distinction there, but um, first, um, um, what I feel interesting is that um, my senses, how I feel, well, um, yes, um, you lose um, the feeling of being um, vertical or horizontal. Now, where your legs are located, you feel like it's the floor. And if you change your posture, and, and um, then that place where your feet are located 
feel like the floor. So um, I think um, that when we say the upside and downside, it's uh, um, just for the sake of convenience. In outer space, I think it's just in relative terms that you feel that you are upside down or the other way around. Hello know from NHK, um, astronaut Furukawa. Another thing about the shuttle. Well, um, well, it was a tough. Um, um, well, um, the Soyuz. Um, you've flown at the Soyuz, but don't you wish that you had been on board the shuttle? Hi, <laughs> Igosu,ありがとうございます. <laughs> Thank you for that very good question. Of course, um, um, in order to become a mission specialist, I have undergone harsh training, and I wish I had been able to travel on the space shuttle, but not everything goes as you wish in life. But um, at present, I'm very satisfied uh, because um, there are three reasons for this. Um, first um, is uh, that um, the Soyuz, um, this is a very highly reliable uh, Russian uh, space um, vehicle, and um, I was able to, on board the Soyuz, um, to arrive at the ISS and to make contributions to the ISS activities. And the second is that um, I, as a Japanese astronaut, was able to welcome the last crew on board the space shuttle. And also, the space shuttle Atlantis. Um, I um, believe um, that um, I was the first um, to encounter um, Atlantis, and also um, um, Chris um, uh, Ferguson, the commander, has um, made my wish come true, and he let me sit in his commander's seat and take a photo. So um, that was a wish come true. I'm Komiyama of Asashi Shimbun News. Question to Ms. Uh, Dr. Furukawa. This is about the month since you have left uh, the ground, and probably you have opportunity to look at the disaster hit area from IS. If you have any message to those people who have been impacted by the disaster, would you please give? Yes, uh, I personally traveled to Tohoku area when I was a high school student, and I was very moved by those people who are very friendly uh, people there. So I have very good memory of visiting there, and four months have passed, but I believe that things are still very difficult for them. But uh, what I can say is that if we continue to do uh, what you can do on the day, tomorrow would be better than today. And also, uh, all the colleagues from here, from U.S. and Russia, everyone uh, very much concerned, and they, they give uh, good wishes, and not only U.S. and Russia, but all the people in the world uh, cheering up and trying to be of support. So I hope that uh, keep on trying Japan. There's a question to Mr. Furukawa again from your Miura newspaper. You had worked very hard for the last 12 years, and uh, you finally came to the space, and did you encounter anything that you didn't expect in space? Well, most of the things went as I had been trained. However, one thing that uh, I was a bit uh, surprised was that the things do not stay on surface, because if it is on the ground, if we put something of object on the table, it will stay there, but it will flow out in space. So uh, here we use Velcro to try to fix them on surface. And even if it is fixed, sometimes they float. So that was rather things that I was not tr trained enough in on the Earth, so I'm learning it in situ here. Uh, I'm Oe from Uchu News, uh, Space News from TV Tokyo. You earlier mentioned that uh, but I understand that you visited Space Shuttle to hear a wake-up call. So you are, you are now in space and you visited Space Shuttle, and uh, how did you feel? Uh, listening to Wake Up Call by Elton John, I understand. How did you feel that? Feel about it? Uh, 
変な話なんですけどもヒューストンにある訓練用のスペースシャトルに本当にそっくりだなそれだけ訓練用のものがよくできているそれにそっくりだなというのを感じましたそして訓練用のスペースシャトルの匂いがしたのが発信でしたでそのようなものがそっくりなので素晴らしいこと感じたのでしたそれは本当に Exactly the same environment as I had been trained in Houston. I, I was very moved to hear the wake up call of music by Elton John. And I was very grateful for that opportunity that was, that was given to me. Dr. Furukawa,、uh, I would like to hear about、uh, World Cup ladies,、uh, women's、uh, World Cup. And, Uh, you have a lot of American, US friends around here, but what do you、uh, think is going to be the result and score for the World Cup final? I think it's going to be a little bit difficult to answer to your question in this environment, but what I can say is that all the athletes, supporters, all the people who are concerned with the athletes, supporters, all the people who are concerned with the Concerned there, I hope that everyone would do their best. That's my wish. Atlantis ISS, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Thank you, media at Johnson Space Center, Kennedy Space Center, NASA headquarters, Marshall Space Flight Center, Ames Research Center, and in Japan. Atlantis ISS, we are now resuming operational audio communications.